Hello, thank you for joining us. I'm John Shefchik, and I'm honored to be the host of this presentation about an amazing animal. The purpose of this documentary is to teach you about the Eastern Timber Wolf. During the next 30 minutes, you will learn many interesting facts about the life of a timber wolf, including its physical characteristics, where it lives, and how it survives. You will understand the challenges that this majestic animal faces in today's world, and how you can help assist in the preservation efforts. The timber wolf lives throughout the world, but primarily inhabits the northern hemisphere. In North America, the wolf is most commonly found north of the U.S.-Canadian border, except in Wisconsin, Minnesota, Montana, and Idaho, where wolves have been reported in the northern regions of these states. At the beginning of the 20th century, the gray wolf and timber wolf population had been nearly eradicated. A slow and gradual decrease of the North American wolf population corresponded with the dramatic growth in human population. Wolves were feared and hunted based on unfounded concern that wolves posed a significant threat to humans and to livestock. Years ago, the United States government offered a bounty on wolves, and hunters took major advantage of this, decimating the wolf population. Fortunately, small groups of wolves survived this slaughter, residing in remote areas of the Appalachians and the Midwest. Due to recent population reintroduction efforts and the placement of the wolf on the endangered and threatened species list, the wolf has made significant comeback. By the 1980s, small and isolated wolf populations expanded in the wake of decreased human density in rural areas and the recovery of wild prey populations. The wolf is known to inhabit small pockets of Eastern Europe. In the Middle East, the wolf population remains stable mostly from lack of human interaction. In Central and Eastern Asia, the wolves are only protected in reserves. The wolves in China are dwindling compared to Mongolia where the numbers are drastically higher. In North America, the timber wolf lives mostly in Canada and Alaska. However, the range has dropped to about 80% of its original size. Additionally, there has been evidence of timber wolves roaming and living in northern Minnesota, northern Wisconsin, and Michigan's Upper Peninsula, as well as in remote regions of Washington, Idaho, and Montana. A male wolf typically weighs between 100 and 120 pounds, while the female is slightly smaller at 80 to 100 pounds. Measurement from the tip of the nose to the tip of the tail is generally 6.5 to 7 feet. The timber wolf is a strongly built animal with a large rib cage and sloping back. Its limbs are extremely powerful and long, with small paws. Wolves are well adapted for speed and running. Their chest is narrow, and the legs are hinged so that the hind legs are placed directly in track with the forelegs. Wolves have four toes and a dew claw on their front legs. Wolves walk on their toes and can rotate the claw, in contrast to a dog that has lost mobility of the claw and walks on the entire pad of its foot. A wolf can sprint as fast as 40 miles per hour and leap 16 to 20 feet in the air. A wolf has incredible strength in its jaw and can bite with pressures exceeding 1,500 pounds per square inch compared to a human's bite strength of 200 psi. Size, strength, specific characteristics, all based on genetic development, make the wolf a very effective predator able to take down prey much larger than itself. A wolf's coat is made of two layers, an insulative down layer and a layer of guard hairs to keep the down hairs dry. The coat is specifically designed for cold weather and allows the wolf to better regulate body temperatures in the severe cold. The coat can vary in coloration from white to brown to blonde and black. There are no major differences between males and females in coat color, but females may show more reddish tones. The entirely black coat of a wolf has been seen in Yellowstone. 
A wolf's ears are broader at the base than they are tall and have a thick covering of hair inside the ear. A wolf's ability to hear is at a similar level of the acuity of a bat or a porpoise. Wolves can routinely hear sounds within a six-mile range and have been reported to hear up to ten miles away. They can hear higher frequency sounds as well as discriminate between tones with much higher definition than the human ear. Wind, rain, and adverse weather can distort sound, forcing the wolf into a state of higher alert. Sound waves can be detected by the wolf via the ear canal or directly through the bone at the base of the skull. The sense of hearing is also highly selective in that the wolf can isolate and locate the source of a sound and not be distracted by secondary sound, and thus hearing is the primary sense for communicating. It is thought that wolves are partially colorblind. However, they have keen night vision, and the location of their eyes provides excellent peripheral field of view. Night and peripheral vision are important to their success as hunters and predators, allowing detection and discrimination of movement from a distance, such as would be noted in a weakened or disabled deer on the outside of the herd. Unlike a dog, the wolf has eyelashes on both the upper and lower lids, which serve to better protect the eye as well as function as dust filters. The eyelids are black, typically surrounded by lighter color fur, and the amber eyes accentuate the black pupils. Both features are used to communicate. For example, mood, as reflected by pupil size, is easily communicated by the appearance of the eyes. It is estimated that a wolf's sense of smell is one million times more sensitive than a human's. This is partially due to the olfactory center of the wolf's brain being 15 times larger. Thus wolves can more readily discriminate odors. While a human may only smell the woods, a wolf can separate this odor into hundreds of discrete bits of information. Combined with a powerful olfactory memory, the ability to detect and discern different odors allows the wolf to better survive with hunting and communication skill. To learn about the life history of the timber wolf, we're privileged to be joined by Ms. Nancy Dowler. Nancy is the Director of Animal Care and President of the Timber Wolf Preservation Society in Greendale, Wisconsin. Nancy, I understand that you have devoted your life to the timber wolf. Yes, John, I have. I have spent every day since 2001 with our wolves that we currently have there. I enjoy lecturing and teaching about these wonderful animals, and I love what they can teach me. Wow, that's fantastic. Nancy, on average, how long do wolves live? Generally in the wild, they live like six to eight um, in captivity, we, our oldest was almost 20 when she died. Uh, but they're getting better care than what happens in the wild. You know, usually in the wild, the uh, hardships they suffer are, you know, um, parasites that could get hurt and injured from the prey that they take down. Is there any risk of injury from their enclosures? Well, there could be if you don't take care of those things beforehand. Um, obviously, when that huge animal hits a platform from 20 feet away, there's a lot of pressure there and a lot of poundage hitting. So you've got to know how to put their enclosures in there and the fencing and everything so there is no injury. Can you describe what wolf cubs look like at birth and what are some major milestones as they grow up? Well, at birth they weigh about a pound. Um, when they're like 10 to 12 days old is when we take them from the parents, bring them in the house. We catch them before their eyes open, which is 13 to 15 days. Their eyes are blue when they open. Um, when they're about six to eight weeks old, then their eyes will turn into amber. Um, hearing is not developed until about 20 days. Um, they are sensitive to loud booms or something, but for vibrations. But 
At two weeks, the cub usually weighs about seven pounds, and at this point, then their eyes are open and developed, and their milk teeth, and, and they'll be walking by that age. At three weeks of age, they begin to immerse from the den, and will they'll eat food regurgitated by their mother or one of the other adults of a wolf pack. Four weeks old, their ears go up, and they weigh about 15 to 20 pounds. And uh, they're weaned about 30, somewhere around 30 days, we wean them off of milk into uh, uh, solid food. And the wild cubs only have a 50% chance of uh, surviving until, you know, their first year. Um, at that time, they begin to travel, you know, by the time their first fall comes, they're just about full grown, so they start to travel with the pack for hunting. Females um, breed about 22 months and males at 32 months. And they're actually considered adults at about three years old. Um, they're just about full grown, you know, that first fall, but then they start building muscle mass and bone mass after that. Most wolves are pack animals, meaning they live together in small social groups. A lone wolf is a rare occurrence. In Wisconsin, the average pack consists of two to ten wolves and is comprised of the mating pair and their offspring. Once sexual maturity hits, the grown-up pups disperse. Packs rarely take in other wolves unless that wolf is an immature animal since it will not be competing for breeding rights. Wolf packs have been known to join forces during times of migration or other hardship. Wolves are very territorial. They designate and protect territories bigger than actually needed in case of hardship, but typically the size of their territory is dependent on how much prey is in it. Wolves mark their territories by scent and then defend their location by attacking invading packs and howling. When a wolf first breeds is largely dependent on availability of resources. A female wolf shows she is ready to mate by averting her tail to the side. During pregnancy, females will stay in a den away from the edge of their territories. Wolf pregnancies usually last 63 days and thus the litter is typically born in the early summer. The average litter is four to six pups which are all covered in short, dark fur. Their eyes open at 13 to 15 days, and hearing develops at 20 days. Pups usually leave the den about three weeks after birth and start to play fight. This playful behavior soon becomes meaningful as pups establish leadership, usually five to eight weeks after birth. By autumn, the cubs are allowed to hunt with the pack and are nearly adult size. There has been no scientific study that defines a wolf's intelligence, but numerous wildlife studies have hinted that the wolf is a very intelligent animal. Wolves have been known to follow the sounds of gunshots. During the bison eradication, wolves were reported to wait until the hunters skinned the animal so that they could dine on the leftover carcass. Wolves now avoid open areas because they are easy targets for hunters, especially those hunting from helicopters. Wolves that have had previous experience with traps have learned to activate them with no harm to themselves. Wolves cannot be tamed or trained. However, they may be conditioned and become accustomed to certain behaviors. That alpha female, I mean, I call her kick butt girl. Tolerance and patience she used in trying to teach me. And all she ever did, if I did something wrong, she, like I said, give me that dirty look. And, and one day I came out of there and I turned around to shut the gate and lock it. And she's standing there with that smile on her face like, you know, when you're a kid and you do a, a good job on your paper and the teacher has that proud look. Mm -hmm. That's what she had on her face and I couldn't believe it. And it's like, she just taught me a trick. Even though wolves are social, lone wolves or pairs have a higher killing rate. Wolves hunt by locating the prey, usually by smell, and getting as close as possible to the animal. Wolves quickly give chase to prey that have startled and run, 
with the intent to capture and kill. Large prey is usually killed by blood loss from bite wounds, while medium and small-sized prey is killed by being bitten around the neck. Once prey is brought down, the feeding begins. The mating pair eats first, and then the rest of the pack. Wolves primarily communicate in one of two ways, visually and audibly. They utilize visual communication more commonly than a dog or coyote, since this type of communication is necessary and critically important for successful hunting. Wolves use posture as well as facial expressions and tail and ear positions to communicate. Using different combinations of these visual cues indicate passiveness or assertiveness. Wolves also use howling to communicate. Howling accomplishes three main communications. To assemble a pack, to pass an alarm, and to locate each other. Howls can be heard through areas up to 50 miles. Wolves harmonize their howls to give the illusion that the pack is larger in size and thus more formidable. In North America, wolves can and will kill coyotes, particularly when there are food shortages. Wolves are very important to the ecosystem's balance because they are the main predator of raccoons, wild dogs, and coyotes during the summer season. They refer to the wolf as a keystone species. Mm -hmm. That means whatever happens to him happens to everything else in the forest, including shrubbery and trees and everything. Because if you have an overpopulation of deer, they're going to overbrowse the forest. And they're going to t it's going to take 20 years for that forest to regrow. Mm -hmm. Well, that's going to affect all kinds of other creatures that depend on that kind of shrubbery and stuff, too. Whereas if a wolf takes out a deer, it only takes three years to repopulate that deer. And, of course, the wolves are killing off the old and the sick and the disabled deer, so it keeps those deer herds strong. Plus, you know, when they make a kill, you know, sometimes they'll leave part of the food there, and then all these other creatures come in and eat that, and it's like the whole balance of nature there. There's something there, and we're not going to ever know all the secrets of it. A wolf's only predator is a human. Nancy, wolves have gotten a bad reputation in regards to interaction with livestock. They were once thought to be a significant threat to humans and to animals. This is unfortunate. Wolves have been hunted primarily due to the misconception that they kill livestock. Um, since domesticated animals are not able to defend themselves very well, they make it easy target for wolves. And basically all your livestock that you have used to be a wild animal but has been domesticated by man so you can't really expect them to tell the difference. Um, when food supplies are low in North America the most targeted livestock would be cattle, turkeys, attacks on domesticated animals occurring most frequently when they are grazing. So you're saying that the majority of the time, the incidence of wolf attacks on livestock are extremely low since natural and wild prey is abundant? Yes, that is true. In fact, livestock attacks, um, you know, you'll see them more by coyotes than you will hmm. from wolves. And so we've all heard stories of wolves attacking humans. Is this fact or fiction? Well... There's been some rumors about humans um, being attacked by wolves, but extremely rare. Um, a lot of those haven't been documented cases. Uh, they haven't been researched in the investigations made at the scene and things like that. Um, but generally, I mean, a wolf has such a powerful fear of man, it doesn't want to get near it. Even the, one, even the ones we have, they've been human imprinted, but they would never approach a stranger. Uh, generally, you know, 
frequently there's wolf-dog hybrids out in the wild too. Now that's an animal that has generally lost his uh, fear of man, but still retains the wild behaviors and instincts. So he wouldn't be afraid of approaching a human and then biting him. Now our wolves, like I said, they have such a tremendous uh, fear of man that frequently on the weekend I'll walk around when people are there, especially when we have a fundraiser, a lot of people coming through and just to help keep them calm. So the greatest danger when wolves are near humans is to the wolves, not to the humans. Wolves are extremely hard to hunt simply because they are elusive, they have sharp senses, high endurance, and they are intelligent. Many methods have been used but are marginally effective at best. Even though dogs are descendants of wolves, there are major physical and behavioral differences that some believe were caused by human interaction and selective breeding. Nancy, the life story of the timber wolf is fascinating. However, without the dedication of a few select individuals and special preservation groups across the country, the timber wolf might be extinct. Nancy, why don't you introduce us to the Timber Wolf Preservation Society? The Timber Wolf Preservation Society was actually founded in 1979 by Jim Reeder. He actually received his first wolf, Brutus, in 1967 is when he started working with them. He admired their strong pride and their independence. He learned that wolves are very loyal and they can trust you if you spend the time with them and obey their rules. He really wanted people to learn about the timber wolf. He passed away in um, 2001, that's when I took over. A month after he had passed away, um, we had this litter of six oh, males. Which he would love to have seen, I'm sure. Huh? Yes. Oh my gosh, he would have been so pleased. I mean, it was the first litter I decided sure. to give him liquid sure. vitamins. They all got so big and healthy and powerful and they all wanted to be alpha. Sure. <laughs> so we did have a ceremony for Jim on the premises. We did spread his ashes around the circle in the middle of the yard when he passed away. So, I understand that the Timberwolf Preservation Society is dedicated to preserving the gene lineage of the eastern timber wolf. The wolves that we have are probably the purest gene pool of eastern timber wolf. Nancy, if you could, please tell us what the future holds for the Timber Wolf Preservation Society. We kind of expand our education every year. We try to find something to expand that. Um, you know, it's important in today's world with TV and computers and everything is that you try to be more interactive with children when you're trying to teach them. So we will continue our education. Uh, we just recently put a wolf walkabout. Well, when they walk through, this is something that a wolf could encounter any, any time of the day. A lot of these things coexist quite well with wolves. Um, a lot of it is predator prey. It's really important to show people exactly what a wolf experiences in the wild, uh, but it also helps to have these sort of visual aids so that people can, can see just what these animals look like. When people come here and we, they go on a tour, they are given a lot of information that helps dispel a lot of the myths about wolves, and it also teaches them a lot about their behavior kind of dispels the fact that they're not just, you know, like a little red riding hood, that they function as a family, just as, as we do. We are currently in the process of developing, you know, our website. We're still developing that, but we'd like to add more wolf facts and to that. We'd like to have an educational center. We have a nice pavilion out in that yard and we'd like to get that closed in and at least have a, a sheltered, Place. we could do lectures, we could do classes out there, whatever the weather is, sure, it wouldn't sure. matter then. Sure. So. If someone wants to become involved or to donate to the Timberwolf Preservation Society, what should they do? Just contact us, we are always happy to receive donations, we're happy to have new volunteers, uh, new blood brings in new ideas, you know, we're always open to listening to people's ideas and how we can do something better. Um, if you're interested, you can always call us at 414-425-8264 or you can email us at timberwolfps at yahoo.com. 
Well, we hope you've enjoyed the story of the Eastern Timber Wolf and the Timber Wolf Preservation Society. Additional information is also available on our website, www.timberwolfps.org, or like us on Facebook at the Timber Wolf Preservation Society. I'm Jonathan Nisgoda, a member of Boy Scout Troop 530 in Hales Corners, Wisconsin. I am honored to have produced this educational documentary as my Eagle Scout project. I learned a lot about protecting our wildlife and preserving their natural habitat. It is important that we all listen to the call of nature, for if we don't, we risk the total loss of this majestic beauty. I would like to truly thank everyone that assisted me in making this project a success. I am very fortunate to have had my life touched by so many wonderful, caring, and generous people. Thank you very much.